You are looking live at the Pick 6 podcast via Zoom. Uh, the heavy hitters, Tom Chattel, Dirk Chatlin, Sam McEwen here. Uh, we are doing the Pick 6 podcast as the Nebraska volleyball team is in the midst of uh, the second set of its Sweet 16 match. They won the first set. Oregon is up 24-23 as we speak in the second set. Hello, everybody. This is the Pick 6 podcast for this week, and this is the time that we normally do it. We're doing it over Zoom because there's there's a looming ice storm uh, that might hit. And so I thank you guys for uh, for getting on with me. Uh, how are you guys today? Uh, and uh, yeah, what's going on in your world? Well, Sam, all the buzz is about Nebraska's high-profile, new, expensive, prestigious, uh, sexy offensive line coach. <laughs> <laughs> boy that was a stunner that was a stunner i will admit uh the the last person on the staff that i thought nebraska would keep was the existing offensive line coach so <laughs> uh, i don't know if matt rule can can uh you know can can ruin any of his of his uh fan base or true believers at this point but but that was not a very popular pick yeah, well, you know, it's not official, but I think it's going to be happening. Yeah, I know. Uh, pretty interesting. We'll talk about that. Uh, Matt Rule's staff so far. Um, we'll certainly talk about that. We'll talk about the fact that Nebraska uh, did not really recruit uh, a Heisman finalist who grew up about all oh, 60, 65 miles from uh, from campus. And Max Duggan, congrats to him. Uh, he will be uh, he'll be uh, at the Heisman Trophy ceremony this weekend. Not sure he's going to win. Um, I think he might finish second to Caleb Williams. But we'll talk about Nebraska's uh, struggles to recruit local quarterbacks and how that's changed a little bit, the dynamic of the quality of players that are coming out of here and what that means going forward, whether Matt Rule can change that. I'll talk a little bit about the recruiting weekend. We'll talk a little transfer portal. Uh, that'll probably be more me, although these two guys can certainly uh, weigh in. Uh, Jack Quez Yant has gone into the transfer portal, and I still expect uh, three or four more. Uh, to probably hit the portal here, maybe maybe even a, a kind of a larger name. Uh, you never know uh, whether that'll happen. Uh, we'll talk a little Nebraska basketball. <clears throat> they they lost Indiana, but they still beat Creighton. The, the win did not get erased. They still beat Creighton um, on Sunday. Uh, so that was a big, big deal for Nebraska. And we'll talk a little bit about that, that game and what happened and um, whether that has any bearing on what they can do against Purdue uh, this week. Uh, and then we'll give uh, volleyball updates as we go. I want to remind everybody uh, who uh, thank you if you already subscribe to the Omaha World Herald. If you don't, um, well, we know that you listen to the podcast. The numbers have been going up, up, up uh, in the last couple of months. I think Dirk and Tom have a lot to do with that, and I appreciate their presence here. Um, but we know more people are listening, and we appreciate that. And we want you to subscribe to the Omaha World Herald. There's, uh, you get 26 weeks, six, six months for a buck. And there's a lot going on in Nebraska football, especially over the next six months. So you're going to want to uh, be a part of that. Uh, 26 weeks and a buck. Uh, subscribe, subscribe. You go to www.omaha.com backslash subscribe. All right, gentlemen, we're going to start with football. Let me see if uh, let me see if this uh, second has the second. Uh, yep, the second set has been won by Oregon, 26-24. That means it's going to go at least four sets. And I'll tell you what. I'm not sure. It could go five. It could be a, one of those three-hour matches on a Thursday morning. Isn't that fun? Um, okay. <laughs> but, hey, I'm going to start with this short, like, 90-second <clears throat> rant. Volleyball is a wonderful sport. No reason they can't play it to 21. I think they probably could, and they'd be just fine. In fact, I would even suggest this rule. If the opposing team isn't to 15 points by the time that the leading team reaches 21, match over. Set over. It's over. Just over. If you get to 21 and you lead by six, it's like cribbage or something. You know, like you, you skunked them. And you move on to the next set. You don't you don't play it out and and pretend that some team is going to overcome a six point deficit. Rarely do they do that. Um, so there's my little little rant. That's yeah, a little short the sport. Wasn't this your uh wasn't this your idea when it comes to a seven game series uh in yes. In in the NBA too, if if you yep. don't if you don't win, uh, if you win the first not... three, it's over. It's over. You win the first three games of a seven game series, it's over. Spoken you know, like a man, <clears throat> spoken like a man who's never seen a crazy ninth inning comeback in baseball. That's right. I suppose well, so. 
What would you have done with Red Sox Yankees in 2004? That's the one exception in the room. It's the only one. There's and yeah. there isn't there's no other except well, there was one in hockey. But <laughs> you know what I would say is that you don't you don't use it for the finals. You don't invoke it for the finals. And of course the Red Sox Yankees weren't the finals, but you don't invoke it for the finals. You just do it all the way up till then. And in volleyball, I'm like, if you hit 21 and you're up six, skunk it. You're done. And that would actually improve the quality of play because I think what happens is a team gets up 22-14 and they, they're like, ah, you know, we got some time here. We might as well hang out and lose three points. And let's have let's have a review. It takes seven <laughs> minutes to see if you heard, raise someone's finger, you know. Do you remember when volleyball went all the way to 30 in the early days of rally scoring? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it, it was like shoulder slumping. I remember when volleyball had side out scoring. I remember this because I covered it when I was in college. And I think one match went like three hours and 31 minutes. And it was just, I mean, you know, players had 105 attempts and it was just ridiculous. Arms were, you know, arms were, people were doing arm exercises on the <clears throat> sideline because they were worn out. Anyway, let's move on to Nebraska football. We'll see how Nebraska volleyball does. So, you know, it's been kind of a quiet week in terms of there's been a lot. Of, last week was the loudest week maybe in recent Nebraska football history with everything that happened. This week's been much quieter. However, uh, Matt Rules continue to kind of put together his staff. We know uh, five of those, and then there's three more that basically haven't been re- haven't been announced. Jake Peets, quarterback coach. I think that's a quality hire. A lot of NFL experience there. A uh, guy by the name of Rob Dvorak, and this could change, but, you know, most of the linebackers have been told that Rob's going to be the guy. He's really young, um, played for Rule, uh, was at Lehigh, and then recently coached at Carolina. Young guy, you know, kind of energetic. And then Donovan Rayola, uh, who is who was told in um, both current players and recruits this week that he's returning as the offensive line coach. And uh, I have to admit, that surprised me a little bit. And this is this is one of those moments where I, as a sports writer, can say, I really don't know what the hell I'm talking about with football. Because <clears throat> Matt Rule does. He does. He's smart. He's really smart. And he looks at the work Donovan Rail is doing and is like, this guy's good. And we're going to keep him. And I would say, based on what I saw this year, yeah, they didn't get better from the previous year, so I would assume that maybe the guy's not that good. But there would be no reason for Matt Rule to keep Rayola if he didn't think he was a really good coach. There's other people he could have hired, and he didn't. So he hires Donovan Rayola, or appears to have done so. It's heading in that direction. And I think that was one of that may be the first moment that Husker fans were like, what? They were on board. They liked everything that was happening, but two things have given him pause. Ernest Hausman going into the portal. Reasonable. Reasonable. And then this Rayola hire. And, and it Matt Rule is not doing, he's not hiring a bunch of big names. He's got a big ticket uh salary pool. He's got a lot of money to spend, but he's not hiring um, you know, a lot of big names. You know, uh Deion Sanders went out and hired a very good coordinator, in my opinion, uh, and Sean Lewis. And Dion's obviously at Colorado. Uh, and then he's going to go get a, what I think to be a pretty good defensive coordinator option in Charles Kelly, it appears. And those guys are million dollar coaches. I don't know that he, I don't know that Matt Rule has hired what I would describe as a, as a super top name yet. But but that's the way he likes to roll. Well, <clears throat> let me just hit on Rayola. I I, I threw out a uh, actually uh, 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 a tweet yesterday, which is unusual for me to do, and um, <clears throat> the response was was actually pretty interesting. Um, but my my you know my take is, uh, I I would have hired a veteran offensive line coach last year if I was Frost, because um, even though it was a one year, you know, sort of a hail mary, you want the best, most experienced guy you can do with that offensive line. I, I, I would have done the same thing this time. Go out and get a, a veteran who can help you build an offensive line. Uh, Don Rayola has never built an offensive line. <clears throat> so, however, I, I'm not going to hand him the tab for last year. They The strength and conditioning uh, process and system was not good. Uh, I'm not going to blame him for that. 
the offense did not run the ball. They they didn't they didn't tackle in practice. And they weren't doing a lot of other things in practice either. So if they're not hitting in practice, I'm not going to lay that on Rayola either. So let's see him with a different strength coach and system. Um, you know, different bodies, different guys in shape, and let's see the offense and if they're going to if they're if they're going to run the ball if if they're going to go after it a little bit um, in the offensive line and then I'll judge him. Uh, but I think I think it's a little unfair to judge him after last year because he was an inexperienced guy thrown into a really impossible situation because Scott Frost did not care about offensive line and uh, or or. Strength and conditioning. So, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 it was, it was, it was, it was baffling, and yet I, I'm, I'm willing to give the guy a chance because he played at Wisconsin. He knows what it look, He knows what it's supposed to look like. So, um, it's not a total flyer. It's just we don't know. Sam, I, uh, I think we can separate the two, the two thoughts. Okay, one there's a possibility that he's going to be a, a great offensive line coach someday um, while also acknowledging that it was an absolute stunner that he kept the job right. because uh, first of all, coaches, new coaches rarely keep assistant coaches uh, unless they have some sort of, you know, value in, in recruiting or uh, one, you know, some, some distinct reason to, to, you know, retain the job. Uh, and then, you know, just based on the performance last year, I, I think it would be it would be very difficult for Rayola to turn on the film and, and show Matt Rule what happened last year and say, see, this is why I should have the job. Right. Um, so to me, I mean, to me, the, the thing that makes the most sense is that he's got relationships with those offensive linemen that Rule did not want to start over on the O-line. Um, right. You know, he didn't want to. He didn't want to have to go get a bunch of portal guys. He didn't want to, you know, be starting true freshman next year. And then he was worried that if he if he changed offensive line coaches, you know, there was enough potential backlash there where he'd lose, you know, a couple starters that he didn't want to lose. Um, that's the only thing that makes sense to me because I, I don't think Rayola is uh, is a very compelling candidate for the job, uh, especially considering it's it's arguably the most uh, important position coach on the entire roster. You know, this isn't like keeping a tight ends coach from last year or a linebackers coach or something like that. Uh, this is, you know, this is the, the foundation of your entire football program, the offensive line. So, uh, I, you know, what what was the bigger stunner last week? Nebraska beating Creighton in basketball or, or Rayola keeping the offensive line coach? Uh, I, I think you can make a pretty com pretty compelling case both ways. Yeah, you could. Um, I think that's probably, <laughs> yes, it was. I don't know uh, about that. I don't know about that. Um, I think it's, way? I think it just, it just underlines that Matt rule is going to basically coach a lot of things. He he's, he's going to have his hands on a lot of things and the offense is probably going to be redesigned to some degree. Um, and, and that'll be, that'll be notable. Um, Nebraska kind of had a hybrid, uh, Frost Whipple design going into the season, and then Scott Frost got fired, and then it was kind of Whipple's offense. And Whipple doesn't have a lot in the run game arsenal. Like that's just not what he does. He, he you know, he has some run plays, but he likes to throw the ball around, and and um, that's that's largely what happened. The other thing that that Mark Whipple really liked doing, and and is he like running what's called an unbalanced line. And he would put Turner Corcoran and Bryce Benhart next to each other, two tackles next to each other, and then they'd have a guard inside. So it was true unbalanced line, and they put a tight end on the short side of it right next to the guard. And honestly, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to block, you know, 70% uh, of a game as a tackle and then have to block as a guard. And that's what Turner Corcoran was having to do every single game. I mean, he was playing tackle, and then he was playing guard on third down. And that's hard. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of teams will do that. You know, a lot of I don't think Marcus Satterfield, the the uh, the new offensive line, the new offensive coordinator, will do a lot of that. I, th I think you'll just see them be a little bit more traditional. And so mm -hmm. I can understand those things. I think ultimately, when you look at rule staff so far, outside of special teams, which I think 
And I listened to Matt Rule on a on a speech he gave to the AFCA where he's like, "Special, I tried coaching special teams myself, and it's just not my passion," is what he said. And um, and I think he kind of gives that to Foley, and Foley handles it. But I think in so many of the other areas, Matt Rule is going to have a lot of coaching points. Like he's going to have a lot of opinions. Maybe not quarterback. I think Jake Peets will handle that, and I think Marcus Satterfield will handle that. But I think a lot of those other positions. Matt Rule is going to be a hands-on coach. He's going to have an opinion about about line play. He's going to have an opinion about a tight end. He's going to have an opinion about linebacker. Um, in this way, and I'm not trying to you know kiss his butt, but in this way, Matt Rule is kind of a throwback where he can kind of, he he has learned to coach a lot of different positions. I think he has a lot of opinions about coaching various positions, and not unlike his mentor, one of his mentors, Joe Paterno, who coached everything, he kind of coached the whole team. I think Rule will be one of those guys. He'll kind of coach everything. And his staff, thus, is young and and coachable and will do what he asks them to do. And, and so as a result, I think a lot of the guys he has will kind of follow from the Matt Rule playbook. I'm trying to get my hands on, you know, this, like, Matt Rule's kind of got a, I don't know if it's a Bible, but it's kind of like a a thing, you know, a man, hey, like, so, hey, so I, that that'll be something that'll be interesting to watch. Go oh, ahead, Tony. Sam. Um, let me ask you this, Sam. Why, why does he have a six million dollar assistant salary pool if he's if he's uh, if he's not hiring experienced guys that are that are big candidates out on the market? Well, we'll see what he does with defensive coordinator. That could end up being a big ticket guy. That could end up in theory being Jim Leonard. I don't think it's going to be, but. Because I think Leonard's got some other head coaching opportunities that he might pursue, but right. <clears throat> I think there's I think there's enough. There's two positions left: defensive coordinator and wide receivers coach. And wide receivers coach could be a recruiter. Defensive coordinator could be a big time DC. It could be somebody that we're not thinking about or a big name. I've also heard some other names that aren't as big, you know. But I mean, Jeff Collins would be an interesting name. Uh, there's a guy out of Florida uh, that's been a DC and Army in North Carolina. He'd probably be a million dollar guy mm. in Florida this year. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a chance that there's some big ticket names still coming, and they just haven't been revealed yet. All right, okay. Um, we would agree that uh, Matt Rule's coaching staff at Baylor was probably pretty good. Um, or I always said they did a good job, right? Yes. Okay, his last offensive line coach at Baylor was a guy named Sean Bell, who played quarterback at Baylor, one of their better quarterbacks. He's now the quarterback coach at Baylor. So for one year, he made him the offensive line coach. The last year they were there, and what they they won eleven games. Um, so that tells me Rule might have been involved in some stuff. Yeah. Um, his first offensive line coach at Baylor in 2017 was. Um, I got him George DeLeon, who was a had like who was with him at Temple. He was an old guy who had had like 40 years in football, a lot of NFL experience, a lot of college football. Um so his first guy was an old guy who'd been around forever, and then he just plugged in a former quarterback to coach the line. So um Guys, that, I, tells, that, that tells that, you yeah, that I, Matt Rule does a lot of the coaching. He's he, got confidence in in his system. Yeah, he can say I, I can put this guy here and this guy there. I don't know. I think he does a. I'm not. I'm not. To, I think he coaches a lot. I think. I think Rule has his hands on a lot of different things. It's it's different from a lot of other coaches. He's not. He is a CEO coach, but he's like the CEO who's also the coder. He's the tech. He's the tech head. He's like the tech bro, but he's also the coder at the same time. I, again, I don't. I don't want to disqualify Rayola from. You know, I don't want to say that he's one one bad year on the offensive line means that he can't ever be a good O line coach. I just I just find it stunning that he could persuade Matt Rule that that he's the guy. <laughs> I mean, no relationship. Um, you know what what Nebraska's weak link was last year. I mean that I just how do you walk into that interview and come out with the job? It's it's baffling. Well, I don't know, Dirk. It's it's a great. Question, and I'm, I'm sure we'll find out um, soon. I, again, I want to see a lot of pounding in spring football, and I think 
the offensive line coach can only do so much. It has to be the offense. It has to be the way they practice. It has to be the athletes they recruit and uh, and what kind of shape they're in. I, I remember Mel Tenniper and um, uh, Boyd Epley getting into heated arguments. You know, Mel had to have it his way, and and they got in they got into it uh, a couple of times. So um, I don't know. I guess we'll find out, but. Um, I was intrigued by his two line coaches at Baylor and, um, you know, we'll see, but, um, you know, the, the defensive coordinator, I, you know, what's he waiting for? He's had one guy basically. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that guy. Huh? I don't know if it's going to be that guy. Right. Um, so, I mean, if, if yeah. it was going to be him, he'd, he'd already be there. Right. Yeah. I think, I think so. Uh, you know, as oh. I look at his, uh, his name's Phil Snow. And, you know, um, I think this is a four-year deal at Nebraska. Like, this is this is going to take time. And he's 66. So, th- th- he may be ready to – Right. He may be ready to just be done. I was talking to Mark Banker, Nebraska's former D.C. coach. I was texting with him. And, you know, he didn't know Phil Snow. Like, Phil Snow was a West Coast guy for a long time. And so, Banker, you know, kind of traveled in the same circles – um, so we knew of him and respected his work and all the rest. Well, you know, Banker just retired. Like, and Banker's, I don't know, 63, 64. And Phil Snow's 66. And he's from, you know, he's from California. And I'm I'm guessing maybe he doesn't want to come and do this for four years in Nebraska. Um, that may just be how it goes because he's a good coordinator. Or maybe he wants to stay in the NFL because he's done a good job up there and doesn't yeah. really need to leave. Like, it's possible he'll catch on there. Um, but he's obviously still coaching that team. Like he's, he's, you know, like it, well, no, he, I think he was let go. I think he was let go, um, when rule was let go, but it's probably just time. I don't know. Um, that would have been a, that would have been a court, a hire that made sense. I think they've, they're looking at, they're looking at different things. So it could be, it could be a lot of different names. Well, I, 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 I'm intrigued by the, the coordinator one because that he likes defense, and 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 that that's a big one. Um, Jim Leonard is. Um, I can't wait to see where he goes. You know, it's like, are are you mad, bro? Are are you going to try to get back at Wisconsin? We, to do that, you'd come at Nebraska. We, would you go to Purdue to be the head coach? Would they hire him? Um, I'm I'm kind of curious about that one. You know, does he stay in the Big Ten? And um, I don't know because uh, that was a weird the way that thing played out. Was certainly weird. But anyway, well, I, I I'm not trying to knock Leonard. I, I think Purdue will have better options, more experienced options, right, on the table for that job than to give it to to a defensive coordinator in the Big Ten, like. The last time they hired Jeff Brom, and Brom was, you know, a quality coach from Western Kentucky. Um, this time, I've heard Dan Mullen, which is interesting. Well, they always uh, lean offense. Their their whole their whole uh, tradition and heritage is right uh, quarterbacks and uh, offense. So, yeah. um, and Mullen, I mean, Mullen would be a a, a gr- good hire, I think. I well, I'd be a fish out of water. Ailes, yeah, I don't think what ails Florida football was Dan Mullen's fault. I, I understand that he ruffled some feathers down there, but the work he did at Mississippi State was pretty damn good. Uh, and uh, if they're able to get Dan Mullen, I think I think there'd be a lot of heads nodding in Purdue. But but they have some other good some other good candidates uh, potentially too. <clears throat> the fact that Jeff Brom left, he's going back to his alma mater at Louisville, and 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 I appreciate that he's doing that. But I but I also think it's again just a canary in the coal mine moment. Where, you know, I, I just don't know that I think Brom probably like this. This is about as good as we're going to get here at Purdue. Um, we've 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 maxed out. We won. You know, we won a divisional title. We got to eight wins. They might get to nine in the bowl without him. But uh, that's probably about as good as Purdue's going to do. And it was a perfect and time to leave. Perfect. It was a perfect time to leave. But it's also just a reflection of this thing's going to get hard. It's going to get really hard uh, really soon. Uh, next year they'll have a division, but after that, there are no divisions, and it's going to hurt. You know, it's it's going to hurt some teams because they're not going to have a little a little trinket to put on the wall for for winning the B B League. 
And he's going to have a lot easier in the ACC. I think he's going to do well. He's going to recruit right. quarterbacks. Um, right. They're, they're going to win a bunch of games, and he'll be right. um, maybe not in the playoff, but he'll he'll be knocking on the door probably. That's right. I I totally agree. The chances of you know having a special season where you win eleven games is a lot better there um, than it is here. Obviously, PJ Fleck. Got another, here, yeah. You notice PJ Fleck got another contract deal too. Yeah, how did he? He's got a great agent. Didn't he just get a contract a couple years ago? Yeah, PJ Fleck was, you know, inquired. What the heck? I heard from a source that he inquired of the Auburn job, and Auburn was like, "That's okay." So, um, well, what, yeah, did he take the, he he take that axe from the Wisconsin game and go after his AD or something? How did he get a, another extension? Yeah, I don't know. He he was pretty mad um, after that after that win um, because people <laughs> were mad at him for not beating Iowa. He's never beaten Iowa. And uh, they were mad at him for not winning that game. And then right. you know, I've won this. I've won this axe three times. And people last week, people wanted to get me fired. Right. Whatever, you know. <laughs> and, and that's all. That's all fine. It's, it's, I, I think probably what ends up happening there is if you win the if you win the if you win Floyd, then you want you you need to win the axe. And if you don't, and if you win the axe, then you need to win Floyd. And if you don't win them both, I don't know. It doesn't matter anyway. He's staying around. I don't know who else would hire him at that level of a power five. And he's, so he's sticking around. It's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to win in this league. I think you're going to see coaches that want to get out because they're like, eh, we're not going to win here. We're, we're going to, we're going to, you know, or, or, Hey, if you want me to stay, you better be ready to pay me nine or $10 million to win seven or eight games because we're not winning 10 or 11. And so you as an AD better expect that and just be happy with what you get. And by that, I think, you know, there's just certain coaches in the league that are just, they're not going to win 10 games very often and just wonder if Nebraska will be one of those schools. So we had an interesting debate here about two weeks ago. Um, and it, I think it was in regard to Fickle. And I, I still think it's a fascinating debate. Like you just said, Braum might be able to have a magic season and win 11 games in the ACC. Um is it, doesn't the same thing apply to Fickle in Wisconsin? I realize there's more resources at Wisconsin than there are Purdue. Uh, I realize that he can, you know, if, if everything goes right, he can he can win a national championship or certainly get to the to the Final Four. But um, man, like I realize Cincinnati's not, you know, not the most prestigious job in the Big Twelve. But some of these guys. They got to be thinking, can I really survive in the Big Ten? Like, wouldn't I rather be a big fish in a small pond? I mean, it's the money's well, going to be the money's going to be a factor, but but man, it's it is daunting when you look at Lincoln Riley and Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State, and um, you got you really got to ask your athletic director, are you okay if I finish sixth? You know, are you okay if I finish sixth every every year uh, and maybe occasionally fourth? But uh, I think. As you noted, Sam and Tom, a lot of these schools are going to have to have sort of a, a soul searching moment where they reassess expectations because, um, you know, winning the West is not the same thing as finishing fifth in the Big Ten. Well, exactly. Right. A great point. We haven't gotten there yet, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anybody's ready to uh, accept that yet. But um, you know, they they did fire Paul Christ, who wasn't losing. He 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 was winning. So. Um, Maybe the new AD w w wants to up the ante, but um, you know, I, I think about Luke Fickle in Cincinnati. Uh, Scott Frost won that league and <laughs> went undefeated. Um, maybe the difference is Luke Fickle is is, is 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 sort of a child of the Big Ten. He grew up in the Big Ten. He knows the league. Uh, he's been through it at Ohio State, uh, where, where Scott never did. Um, so maybe that gives him an advantage at Wisconsin over what Frost, Frost maybe just a better coach anyway. But um, it, it'll be something to watch, absolutely, because um, you know we've. Uh, <laughs> I I can't figure out Wisconsin. The fact that they fired Chris, um, I thought we, I thought it was to get Jim Leonard, and apparently it it it, it wasn't. So. Uh, I, I don't know what they want or what their standard is, but um, I agree, Dirk. Um, and that question will have to be asked uh, at uh, Lincoln, Nebraska as well. You know, what's going to be good enough? And um, I, I believe, I mean, I think you guys probably believe it too, that, you know, you get better by being challenged and you get better by being in, in really good leagues. Um, 
great programs make you better. They bring out your best. But <clears throat> Dabo Sweeney might be sitting there in the best spot there is because the ACC is going to stink. Um, you know, he's if he goes eleven and one, he's he's going to make it a lot of years. Um, and I don't know if you can say that about. I mean, it's it might be better off being the the best program in in one of the bad leagues as opposed to, and maybe that's why Deion Sanders went to Colorado. Uh, you know, it's it's like, hey, I can I can win ten games here. I don't know if I can win ten the Big Ten of the SEC, but I can do it here. Um, I think it's just an interesting when you when you have that much division or separation between the leagues between the top two and the others, financially, competitively, just the the quantity of teams frankly um i think i think there's a there may be the pendulum might shift back the other way where some of those coaches look at it and say yeah like let's go to washington that's that's an easier job uh i don't want to go to nebraska or iowa where i have to compete against the big dogs every year now i realize that you know that flies in the face of who they are competitively but man do you want to be lane kiffin at Ole miss right now with texas and oklahoma coming in like that doesn't sound that interesting to me auburn doesn't sound like that good of a job i realize you're going to make 10 million bucks a year but but man that's that's <laughs> tough I, th- I think i'd rather be at, i'd rather be at tcu I, i'm not sure texas and oklahoma are good jobs right now <laughs> going into that league um they're going to find out in a hurry about their coaches um yeah i the one thing about Dion that intrigues me, I I, I think I think he saves the Pac-12 or the Pac-10 or whatever it's going to be called. Um, I think he they, they were they were really on the edge. The networks, you know, w- w- want to save the Pac-10 and have have nighttime games. Uh, I I think Dion saves that league for, at least for now. <clears throat> mm. um, interestingly enough, I want to go back to Wisconsin for a minute. Yeah. Do you know who Wisconsin hi- is hiring for its offensive coordinator? I just saw yeah. it. Who is it? Yeah. North Phil Carolina. Longo, who's yeah, in North Carolina. Carolina, and they have the number fifteen total and the number fifteen scoring offense in the country. Wisconsin's going to pay a lot of money for him. I mean, I don't know what they're going to pay million and a half. Um, and then he's and then Fickle's bringing you know Jim Tressel's nephew or I can't remember what it is from Michigan from from Cincinnati, and then the guy was at Michigan State. But anyway, yeah, we don't need to get down a rabbit hole. But the bottom line is. You know the coordinators at, at Wisconsin are going to be top of the line. I mean, they're they're going to be pretty good. And the way that Fickle is doing this is much more traditional. He's he's going and getting assistants, you know, that are high level that have won a lot. And Matt Rule's doing doing a different path. And it'll just be really interesting to watch. As far as Dion's concerned, you know, um, that's going to be uh, the, his first home game. It's against Nebraska. Tickets are going for four hundred dollars online right now. Which is makes sense. Um, although, you know, he's not going to play in the game. So I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to watch him walk the sideline in his sunglasses. I don't know. Um, but, you know, there's a good chance that he, I, the way I put it, is there's a low floor and a high ceiling. Um, he could go there and things could go really poorly, but they could go really good too. And you could, you could potentially win big and then he leaves because he's probably not going to stay in Colorado forever. Who cares? Yeah. It, it, you know it, what though? Yeah, I, 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 I don't I don't yeah, I don't have an existential either. concern over the over what Colorado does, but right. but the point being that mm. that they made an interesting hire in the sense that they went for um that it's not a long term play. I mean it's just not it's Bob Huggins at K State for basketball is what it is. It's it's a it's it's a we need to get this thing going and we have no idea how long he's gonna be here. But in the meantime, we're gonna we're gonna film him talking to the team for 15 minutes and telling him anybody who doesn't want to stick can get the hell out. Like it's it's like I, who, I who love the hire. I thought, speech, who filmed yeah, that's a great hire the players. Yeah. Hey, didn't you just didn't you just describe Matt Rule in Nebraska? No, uh, I did a, a not. Great, a great connector who uh-uh. uh, is talks a great game uh, would feel just as comfortable at a pulpit as he would, you know, standing in front of a team. Yeah. And and yeah. by the way, and by the way, we have no idea how long he's going to be here. Right. Well, the, the difference being that again, like Sanders right. is hired, and then they and then they take the cameras into the <laughs> into the the meeting room, and they you know, and he paces back and forth and. He clearly rehearsed the speech. It's a tremendous speech. It's it, it it belongs in a movie. Sanders is one of the great talkers of really of any of sports. And um, but I mean, 
you see the expressions of the players and they just they have no they're not even into it like it's a great speech and they can't even get into it because there's cameras there hey and it's just it's just bizarre it's a bizarre this, moment this is an honest Honest statement for me. If if Pac-12 Network doesn't do a hard knocks with Colorado football, right, do it. Yeah. they're they're missing out. Like that that might save the Pac-12 network if they do right. that. No, uh, that was the whole Tom's got a great point that this does help the Pac-12's visibility. No, no question. <laughs> but, that, but that was the but that, that was the whole point of hiring him was to get Colorado on TV. Yeah. Now, they should have yeah. a camera following him everywhere because it, it'll work. The whole point, they, they can't lose. This is a no lose hire. If it, well, if it flames out, they were they were flaming out anyway. They weren't they right. were out there at the bottom. But this Nebraska not, should. But Nebraska would not. That wouldn't be a good hire for Nebraska. Well, no, because Nebraska the aspirations got, at Nebraska are different than Colorado. Nebraska got what they needed because they're in a different conference and right. the, their their whole tradition is is to build a program and have offensive line, all that stuff. We'll see how that works out. Yeah, it, it's a different deal, but yeah, I think it's it's fascinating. And if he leaves, I mean, I, I I'm not sure why Auburn didn't hire him over you free. I mean, I don't, you know, because you have to win games, and well, you have to win games at Auburn. It can't be well, a. He, it's who not says a, he won't? It's not I don't a, know. You know. I, I, I I'm I'm fascinated by it. Um, I, like, I would just well, that I, stuff's I, not going to beat Alabama. It's not like he might beat uh, Alabama, but that's not necessarily going to games Jackson State. I I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. That's not and, and, and I think he, he won't out recruit I mean he'll out recruit everybody in the Pac twelve except USC, but he won't out coach him. So but, I don't care who's on his staff. I, I the the fifteen minutes that fifteen minute speech is it's hilarious again, because it's a really good speech. But because there's cameras in there, the players have no expression. They're just like and he's West passing back and forth. He's not even looking at him. And it's like out of a movie. And it's supposed to rile him up. And the cameras are there and the players don't know how to react. And it's yeah. just it's quite a it's quite a moment. Sam, th there's I don't think there's been enough skepticism of Deion Sanders over the last week. Um, you know, I, I think I think there's, there's been any I think there's a lot of issues. I think the national media is just so excited by this that they haven't really asked any difficult questions. But yeah. but if you're Alabama, I would sure as hell rather see Hugh Freeze walk in there than I would Deion Sanders. Because Deion Sanders has a chance to 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 win the recruiting wars against Alabama, and Hugh Freeze does not. So uh, if, if this truly is the okay. – I don't if, know about that. If this truly is the talent acquisition era of college football, which it obviously is, right? Then De Deion Sanders, Deion Sanders is a better hire than Hugh Freeze is because Deion Sanders can he can he can shake up the whole the, the hierarchy of talent acquisition in the SEC, and Hugh Freeze isn't going to do that. The last point I would make about Matt Rule: if Penn State if if he turns it around and Penn State offers him a job in three years, yeah. He's leaving. Rule is leaving, and Nebraska is, you know, I, and I think Nebraska is okay with that. But let's not kid ourselves that Matt Rule is going to be right. the head coach here for for ten years. If, he, Matt, right. Matt, Matt Rule is he's shown no he's shown no evidence that he's going to sit in one place for the rest of his yeah, career. If he, and that's if he makes it a better place, better job, and he, he takes off. My hat's off to him. You know, that's how it goes. And um, yeah, you have to have your eyes open on this thing. Yeah. Um, but but he's going to make it better. possibility so. Nebraska goes in there and loses. There's also the chance that Nebraska goes in there and wins by 40. Because he just, you don't know what kind of roster Dion will have. And you just, but he's made good. He's made good coordinator hires. Um, You know, what else, what else can you say? They've got money. What kind of roster Nebraska's going to have? <laughs> we don't. Who's the quarterback? Yeah, here? Casey Thompson? Uh, Deion we'll Sanders. See. Deion Sanders has has assembled a better staff than Matt Rule has so far. Higher profile staff, yeah. Yep. Yeah. At this point, like I know, so, um, we've we've done this so many times with coaches and and this that and the other that I think the best role for me is just to figure out why they did made the decisions they made than than necessarily say this is great or this is great. The two highest profile coordinator hires that Nebraska has made in the last 10 years 
um, were Bob Diaco and Mark Whipple. And I would, I think it would be fair to say that neither, neither lived up to their billing. And one of them, Diaco was an outright disaster. So, you know, you are, know. you're absolutely, you're absolutely on point with that. And I totally agree that we can't, and that's why I'm reluctant to judge the real, the real thing. But if Dion can be, you know, talent acquisition guy and let his coaches coach, um, you know, I, I think, I think it can work. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if he and Matt rule are as different as we think they are. Uh, right. they, they may not be. Yeah, that's that's possible. Nothing that happened at Jackson State, which was an, a, a, a laudable achievement, has has any bearing on Colorado. Jackson State didn't play North Dakota State or South Dakota State, or you know. And I think some of the peers in in the SWAC would would say, you know, the the mission of that of that league is football, but also development and um, leadership development, and 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 it's. You know, and in a way, it's more like um, the Ivy League or something like it's not. So so, you know, it would be kind of like um, Princeton hiring somebody and then they go out and sign a bunch of five stars with NIL money and then they dominate the Ivy League. And so it's it's just not quite the to me. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what I think there was some frustration in within the league of like, well, this isn't really what we we do here. We're trying we're trying to develop leaders for tomorrow and also play football, but not, you know, um, you know, sign multi million dollar deals and things like that. But but that's not the state admission, nor is it the state admission of the Ivy League. So Deion Sanders did it differently. There is actually a um, there is there there is proof that it, that a former NFL star can go to a division whatever you want to call it, division FCS, Jim Harbaugh started his career at the university of San Diego. They didn't play anybody down there. It was, uh, that's, uh, that's one of those, it's like the Patriot league or whatever the hell league it is, where it's not real scholarships for football. And it's, it's like academic and all that. He won there. He took the job at Stanford, which was right where Colorado was when Jim Harbaugh took it. He turned that around and he became a star. And so there is, there is a, um, there, you know, there is a precedent and Jim Harbaugh said it and Jim Harbaugh is just about as odd as Deion Sanders. So that he is a son of a, of a coach. He is. He's in a coaching family. I'm, I don't know about Deion. Uh, well, right. I'm just saying that there, yeah. you know, if there is skepticism, but, but Jim Harbaugh did it, he, he pulled yeah. it off and he, um, he went from San Diego where nobody, you know, whatever. And then he went right to Stanford and Stanford is Colorado in this moment. So we'll see. I, I do think Deion it's really interesting. going back to the assistant coaching staff, the, you know, Dion's ability to bring in high profile coaches to me suggests that, that they believe in him uh, because I don't think they're making a bunch of money. I mean, Colorado doesn't have a $6 million pool for assistant coaches. He didn't, like, the AD like didn't even have the money yet. He said it. <laughs> he hadn't raised the money. Uh, yeah. They're, they're right, waiting. Yeah. Jay, Jason Garrett might go to Stanford and Nebraska volleyball won set three against Oregon. So Jason Garrett. Yeah. yeah that'll, the that'll, that'll scare people. Well, that also means that, uh, that um, NBC, which starts broadcasting games next year for the big 10 has to hire a new analyst. They might want to hire a new play by play guy too, because Chris Collinsworth kid is not very good. So I don't know what NBC is planning on doing there, but I hope it's more than what they're doing now. Um, what, what what else we got? You want to go Husker basketball? Let's do that. Yeah, let's, uh, let me, let's let me talk it. really briefly about recruiting this weekend. Just really, really briefly. The transfer portal's moving. Nebraska's had, I think, 10 guys that have gone in since last Friday or last Thursday or whatever. Jacques Yant today. Um, they have a big recruiting weekend coming up. A lot of current commits are going to go down there. Nebraska needs to – Sort of lock those in. A guy that decommitted and Malachi Coleman is going 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 down there to, tomorrow, you know, seven miles from his house. And I, I do think Nebraska can retain him. <coughs> There's a transfer coming in Elijah Judy. He's a Texas A&M um, transfer. And then and then uh, <coughs> AJ Cornelius, a transfer from Rhode Island. FCS offensive linemen, if you want to know how important offensive linemen are, A.J. Cornelius has about 30 offers in a week. 
Nebraska was the the second one to offer him. He's coming here this weekend. That's a big deal. Um, they have to replace Ben Bramer, which was a big loss in the class. So Andrew Metzger, who Nebraska B listed earlier, is going to come. He's a Colorado commit who's probably going to be run off by Dion. So he has to find a new place to play. And Nebraska's got a spot for a tight end because, you know, Ben Bramer flipped to Iowa State. Uh, Quentin Ives, who's a running back that was kind of connected to Connecticut, where E.J. Barthel was at. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. He's coming this weekend. Um, Arnold Barnes decommitted from Nebraska. Nebraska wasn't going to retain him anyway. Um, so Ives is going to come visit. You're going to see multiple backs transfer, I think. You'll see maybe multiple backs transfer in. Like it's There's going to be a lot of movement at certain positions. A good chunk of Nebraska's defensive linemen who didn't play this year are in the portal. There's a reason for that, that they, they didn't recruit the position very well. Um, and then you're going to see some other guys trickle in as well. The two that hurt a little bit are Ernest Hausman and then Jamari Butler, who went into the portal and is getting good offers. And Nebraska spent three years developing Jamari Butler, and now he's going to leave. And when Nebraska took him back in 2020, they took a flyer on him. And uh, they developed him for two and a half years, built him up in the weight room, all the rest. Now he's ready to have a really good two or three years of football, and he's going to leave. And that's too bad. Um, those are probably the two that jump out at you. Jock Gant, I, I don't – I actually think Jock Gant's a pretty good player, but um, could, couldn't stay on the field for, for various reasons. doesn't really matter that much. I don't anticipate he'll be returning to the Huskers. All right, on to basketball. I wasn't there Sunday. You guys were. What was that like? It was, it was like, um, <laughs> it was the quietest Nebraska Creighton game I've ever heard. Uh, because the entire time the home crowd was, was sort of sitting in, in silence and shock waiting for a couple three pointers to go in that never went in. Uh, and it, it just, it kept getting later and later and later. And it's like, okay, Nebraska is still ahead. Nebraska is still ahead. And I, I think the Creighton crowd and the Creighton team, frankly, were just absolutely stunned. So uh, it did not have sort of the, the uh, typical atmosphere that you would see at Nebraska Creighton, even when Nebraska is losing to Creighton in Lincoln, uh, the Creighton fans are kind of going nuts. Uh Despite the despite the go big red chance, you know Nebraska fan. There were not a lot of Nebraska fans there, and the ones who were there, I think, were were also in stunned sh silence. So uh, it was just a bizarre sporting event, and and I just I give Nebraska a ton of credit defensively, uh, offensively. I mean, they just they just kind of grinded Creighton down. I I must have said this to six people over the last five days, but um, Derek Walker kicked Ryan Kalkbrenner's ass. And I would not have believed that. Uh, I think it all boils down, frankly, to that sentence right there. So uh, just a, a weird, weird sporting event. And Tom and I just kept looking at each other like, is this really going to happen? Yeah, I, I've never. That was one of the more um, stunning sporting events I've covered in a long time. Um, you know, it was um, the expectation was so built up because of the way Creighton has been built up. And, of course, Nebraska, you know, he's changing again. It's a sad sack uh, program. It's on the, on the edge. Uh, uh, everybody thought it would be 30 points or 40 points by halftime. The, 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 the lead would be this incredible blowout right out of the gate. And that didn't happen. And it, we kept, it kept going. In the first half, all of a sudden, halfway through the first half, 10 minutes left, Nebraska's ahead or right there. And I could just feel the, the atmosphere start to leave. Like, okay, something's not right here. And Creighton coming off the game of Texas where they didn't shoot well. People were starting to get nervous in the first half. And then by halftime, they were getting real nervous. And I, I walked around the concourse and there was, uh, you know, usually people were laughing and smiling and carrying on. It was this big social scene. And they were there were a lot of worried faces. Um, and as that game went on, you know, I've seen Creighton a, a lot, and I thought they panicked. I thought the team panicked. 
I thought that the coaching staff panicked. They never adjusted. They just kept shooting those threes, and they kept letting Nebraska set the pace. Here's Sam you know, Sam Griesel backing in on Trey Alexander, backing in, backing in. every, And they kept letting them do that. They kept letting them. They didn't pressure them much. They didn't really do anything to help Conk Renner down there. Um, it was weird. And then they didn't have to announce twice, if you want to win this game, we need you. you know, we need you fans. We need to be loud. I've never uh, heard that. I mean, you hear it once in a while. Well, it was just loud, Jones. people. Get loud. But when, but they never prefaced it by saying, if you want to win this game, I'm like going, wow, there is panic. There's panic uh, panic at the disco. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, I give Nebraska credit. They really held together. It's a different team. Uh, I don't know how far they can go. But they're going to remember this one. They're going to carry that game. You know, lose Indiana, lose Purdue. They're always going to have that. They're going to have a smile on their face for a while. Um, and I'm anxious to see how Creighton goes forward um, this weekend in Vegas. Um, they've, they've got some adjusting to do. Um, and maybe the expectations were too big. But that's okay because right now people in the national media have just anointed UConn the new favorite in the Big East. And they they've, they've they've already thrown Creighton aside. Maybe that's what they needed, but they've got to get Kaluma off the three point line, and they've got to find other ways to to make shots because people are going to take that um, the game plan, and then they're they're going to force Creighton to make threes the rest of the year, and they're not always going to go in. So, uh, a very strange uh, day, but also memorable for those of us who who cover both. Sam, I. Uh... It's it's really interesting just transactionally when you look at Nebraska. Um, they 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 basically traded the McGowan's brothers and uh, Alonzo Verge for uh, you know a summit transfer and you know Bandamel and Jawan Gary who are all in that six six to six eight range. Um, I don't think any of them really have NBA prospects. I don't think any of them are you know. Are, are planning on being all big 10 players, but they just, they're just gritty defensive minded, uh, hardworking players. And man, what a difference that made in a matchup against Creighton where, um, you know, Nebraska just out hustled them. They just outworked them. They out athleted them. It was really, really impressive. I don't know if Nebraska can play that hard the rest of the year. Um, but man, uh, just, just, you got to admire their effort and I, I, uh, a former Nebraska player reached out to me on Monday and, and pointed something out that, you know, 15, 20 years ago when Creighton was dominating this matchup, even, you know, obviously five or 10 years ago too, uh, Creighton had a lot of, had a lot of Midwest players who, you know, sort of were very aware of, of the Nebraska rivalry and what it meant to Creighton. Uh, Nebraska often had a lot of guys from spread around the country who, who didn't, who couldn't find Creighton on a map. They didn't even know what city it was in and Creighton, you know, sort of had the psychological edge and it has shifted where now Creighton thinks of itself in the class of Arizona and Connecticut and Villanova and Arkansas. And they don't care who Nebraska is like, what, what is the university of Nebraska to them? And, and, you know, Nebraska sort of had the, the psychological edge on Sunday uh, which is not typically how this rivalry works. Usually, even when Nebraska sucks, Creighton is the one that's building up the game to be bigger. Uh, and Nebraska, in this case, I thought took advantage of the fact that that you know Creighton. I don't think they gave Nebraska much respect, and uh, and I thought Nebraska played you know played as hard as they did in part because it was bigger to those guys than it was to the Creighton guys. I, I think it's the first time in a long time. I, mm. Creighton, maybe Creighton's a little blase, huh? Like they're they're too cool for school because of all the teams they had played. Is that? Do you think that's what it was? Well, I, I, I absolutely, yeah, I absolutely, I, I absolutely think that that's true. And, and you know, that's just a natural progression. Like Gonzaga is not going to look at St. Mary's the way that it did twenty years ago, right? Like Gonzaga has has bigger bigger ambitions, and it's part of this is just growing up. Um, and Creighton has to, has to get used to that a little bit, Tom, they're going to face this all year in the big East, where if they're in the top 15 or top 20, they're going to get everybody's best shot. And they haven't, they haven't really 
you know, gotten that treatment a lot over the last five or 10 years. So um, <clears throat> certainly not, certainly not since McDermott was there. So uh, I, I think, I think Creighton is going to have to, going to have to adjust psychologically a little bit to be in the big dog uh, and everybody's going to come after him. And, and, you know, coach McDermott made the same comment that, that they sort of, that's an adjustment. That's a mental adjustment that they have to make. Well, the interesting thing about them is they're the same team that beat Arkansas, but they're also the same team that lost to Nebraska by 10. Um, well, which one are we going to get going forward and how often are we going to get it? Um, but they, I guarantee you they're, that thing, I think there's something to what you said. They, when you beat somebody so much, at, at some point, I don't know if you get bored, but it's, you know, they're, they're, their sites were set other in other places. They're right in the middle of going from Hawaii and Texas to Vegas and then the Big East. And here's this little Nebraska game in the middle. It's almost an afterthought. I guarantee you, it, Nebraska's never an afterthought for their fans or their coaches. Whenever I go to Crane practice, they're always asking about Nebraska. <laughs> and it's just, okay, I get it. Ah. So they're always thinking about them. Um, but the players, I don't think are, and you know, there used to be an assistant coach on that on that staff. Uh, he's the head coach at Drake now, um, Darren DeVries. He was he was the Nebraska guy. He hated Nebraska, and he, when it was Nebraska week, it was like hell week. He made he was like Vince Lombardi. He made speeches, and he got him going, and he stirred him up, and uh, they probably could have used him last week. <laughs> But I just felt like the way the game unfolded, they never expected that that to happen. That, and I don't think that they didn't know how to react to it. Hmm. Well, and and Sam Sam has been beating this drum for a while now, but Fred Hoiberg has has finally leaned into uh, defense and grit and sort of playing like Tim Miles and Doc Sadler did. And uh, I wasn't sure they could pull that off from an identity standpoint, uh, I, I thought it would, you know, that that was sort of desperately throwing your last option at the wall. Uh, but boy, it sure looked like it was, it was sustainable on Sunday against Creighton where you could throw a bunch of guys out there who were six, six to six, eight, uh, and, and just let them fly around and you can muck up the muck up the game enough to, to win a low scoring affair. So I, I was really impressed that Fred Hoiberg did that. I still think they're, you know, one or two players short. Offensively, they're going to have some bad nights, uh, and I think they're going to struggle with seven four Zach Eady on on Saturday <laughs> against Purdue. But, you know, I, I think if you can if you can give Hoiberg a little bit of grace, and I haven't done much of that, and I think there's good reason why I haven't done much of that. But uh, he may have he may have sort of discovered a new template here for Nebraska basketball. And the irony is it's a very old template that I think Tim miles and doc Sadler would have, would have probably told him you have to, you have to play that way if you're going to win here. Hmm. Yeah. They're not going to beat Purdue. Um, if they did, man, that would be really a, quite an achievement. Uh, you know, I mean, Purdue, um, Purdue so well coached. They have a coach that I think does a really nice job and that, you know, they're just tough, I think. And so, whether or not that's a Final Four team or not, I, I don't know. But they're probably a Big Ten champion team. Purdue is. I, I mean, they certainly have the certainly have the the bona fides <clears throat> so far. I mean, what are their? Yeah, I'm going to go Saturday, and uh, I don't expect them to win. But well, I didn't expect them to win last Sunday either. But w what's their record going to be against the other teams in the Big Ten that that are the the middle of the pack, uh, the ones toward the bottom? Um, can they can they beat K State and Kansas City, which will be semi neutral? I mean, these are the games I'm kind of curious about. Um, you know, what does the AD think? Interestingly, AD spoke last week. Uh, Trevor Alberts did a video where he gave black shirts to two of the Huskers, so he, he actually uh, kind of he kind of tipped his hand toward basketball. He, he's very excited about the game, and uh, you know, so. Uh, I think uh, maybe things have, have kind of calmed down a little bit. We'll see. All right, we're going to get out here on this, uh, talking about quarterbacks, right? So there's rumblings. We're trying to com uh, confirm this right now, but rumblings that Nebraska may host a transfer quarterback this weekend. 
and that is Georgia Tech quarterback Jeff Sims. Um, now, Jeff, I don't know if you guys have watched this guy at all, uh, but he's, you know, um, he's a dual threat and kind of a taller guy. Uh, I wouldn't describe him as as a, uh, I don't know, NFL quarterback or like a, you know, like a, a drop back passer, but uh, was a pretty good player at, at Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech wasn't very good. <laughs> Their head coach got fired, but I don't know that that was his fault. 30 career touchdowns, 23 career interceptions, 57% passer, um, which isn't great. Um, you want it to be 60 or above. But, you know, a three-year starter, they didn't throw the ball a ton. They weren't a, they weren't a big throwing team. And he can run. He's a good runner. He's actually a really good runner. So dual threat would run the ball at Nebraska. You wouldn't just sit him back in the pocket. You would you would run him. So I think that's an indicator of maybe where they want to go. Um, he may have other stops that he wants to make too, but but Nebraska is at least uh, the who, first one. Who do you Damn. like for the Heisman Saturday night? <clears throat> Caleb Williams. And, yeah, we should mention this briefly. Max Duggan from Council Bluffs, good luck to him. Nebraska didn't recruit him very hard. Uh, he was in the class of 2019. I've got a photo of him surrounded by Nebraska commits. Um, Garrett Nelson, Ethan Piper, Chris Hickman. Um, I, don't, I don't have it right in front of me, but there were five. Nick Henrich, and then there was a fifth one who I can't remember who was a Nebraska commit in that class, and they're just surrounding him. And then there's Max. And we shot it at Kennefick Park over there, uh, the Union Pacific Park. And uh, congrats to him. Nebraska just does not recruit local quarterbacks very well. Zane Flores is going to Oklahoma State. Mike Gundy was here this week to chat with him. So, uh, boy, it all change. They, they really missed one there. You know, I, I was hoping Avery Martinez would have played last Saturday, so we could have seen. And I, I guess we saw it a little bit earlier when they played uh, back in October. But Adrian versus Max. <laughs> when you say, you know, Nebraska – didn't get up, didn't get in on Max, but they already had Adrian. I mean, who would you rather have? I guess. Um, I, I, I don't know if uh, Max, how would he have fit in with Scott Frost's offense? Is, is Sonny Dykes a better fit for him? It's a great question. I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if Nebraska's fan base could have handled a Max Duggan, uh, Adrian Martinez matchup. I think that would have been too much of a kick in the short. <laughs> Well, good for yeah, Adrian. He's yeah, going to be in the Sugar Bowl. It's uh, he's going to play against Bama. <laughs> That'll be great to watch. Oh, I don't. You think Adrian will play? I don't. I think. Oh, yeah. I think. I, yeah. What I read last weekend was he could have played. Well, he could have played last Saturday if if he needed him. He could have been out there. So I think by the bowl game, I think he'll get in there uh, as just um, uh, a gesture. You know, a, yeah. just sort of a thank you gesture. I think he'll play some. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's the way it goes. He's he's had a terrific career, and yeah, you know, again, I I think Adrian, I, I think it's a great journey that he had to Kansas State. N nothing that happened this season indicates that Nebraska parting ways was a was a bad move. Right. He went to a better football team, and then he got replaced. I mean, he right. got he got benched. So, right. <laughs> like, you know, it, it all worked out. It worked out for him. I mean, it didn't work out for Nebraska, but it worked out for him, and that's great news. And he didn't get back. I know he got hurt, and it was a, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on there. But, but at the end of the day, you know, um, it's it's a cool deal for him to have won at the end of his career. Um, he didn't. He's not a Heisman finalist or anything. So, uh, but he, you know, he was able to go and contribute and win that game against Oklahoma, which he did on his own. So. Right. Sam, I, I want to I want to make one last point because I know you're trying to wrap it up. But man, it is it is really hard for me as an observer of this program, as somebody who has watched Nebraska suck as bad as they have, to to square the two thoughts in my head. Uh, one of which is give Matt Rule time to do it his way, give him time, let it bottom out, let him build it up the slow way, uh, and at the same time. TCU had a losing record last year. Max Duggan was nowhere near the Heisman ceremony, and look at him now. Like, it's amazing how fast some of these programs turn around. 
Yeah. And we tell her, it feels like one minute we're telling ourselves Nebraska is a five year rebuild. You know, you got to let them do it their way and do it over time. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, five minutes later, we're telling ourselves, uh, you know, look how fast it can happen. I, I just, I'm fascinated by that conflict that yeah. I pers- that I personally have in my mind, and that I think a lot of fans have, which is you. There's never been a moment in time in college football where you can turn it around faster than you can right now, and at the same time, Rule has seemingly a, a Herculean task to get this thing up to speed. Um, so I don't know which of those two timelines plays out, you know, or which one, you know, uh, eventually wins, but, but man, it just, it feels like I go back, back and forth in my head over and over. It's like, look at, look at where Duggan was a year ago, you know, like look at where it's, yeah. it's, un, it's unbelievable. I mean, Jim, Jim Harbaugh almost granted totally different level program. Jim Harbaugh almost got fired two years ago. That's right. And, and now he's now he's ruling the Big Ten. He's ruling the northern half of the United States in in college football. Like uh, it's just so bizarre. It's so hard to predict. You know, Mel Tucker. Look what happened there. I mean, you can go up and down the line. Uh, just how quickly these things lurch back and forth. And at one of these days, you would think that that would benefit Nebraska. Yeah. Do you think, so, do you think TCU can beat Michigan? Yeah, I, I do. I absolutely do. I mean, I, 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 I don't think Michigan beat a great team all year until Ohio State. Um, you know, they, so the, you know, the Big Ten was good, but wasn't East wasn't great. Indiana Rutgers, um, Michigan State, um, and then uh, the Big Ten West. To, to Dirk's point, yeah, I saw Big Ten West teams all year. And Nebraska can turn it around next year with the right coach. It's all about the coach. If you get the right coach, you can go fast. Um, but the Big Ten West is no great shakes, man. Every week we saw it. Wisconsin, Minnesota came into Lincoln. They weren't very good. Illinois was fine. They, Nebraska was ahead when Thompson got hurt. I mean, these are games that if they get it right, they can win right yeah. now. So that's – uh that's it. That's all I got. I think the the I think two things are true. One, if TCU were in the Big Ten, uh, they would have had a lot of success. Two, the Big Ten is where you know spread offenses kind of go to die. So if Max Duggan, if you swap Nebraska out and put them in the Big Twelve and TCU in the Big Ten, they're not they're not in the playoff. They're not there. They're 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 not there because. A team that is driven that much by we're going to drop our quarterback back and we're going to throw it to the heavens, which is what TCU does a lot of. They they kind of just throw 500 balls and they have good receivers. That stuff doesn't work in the Big Ten. It just doesn't work. So they would have had success, but they wouldn't be 11-1. and one. And Nebraska probably would be 4-8 and eight in the Big 12. So I wouldn't have changed that. But – one of the things that I think is really helpful about both the Big 12 and the Pac-12 is it's a quarterback's league. And if the Big 10 does not figure that out, you know, if they can't figure out a way to get more offense in the league, it's it's just going to be hard uh, for when teams get to the playoffs to be to have a lot of success. The offenses need to get better in the Big 10 because the defenses right now are so much better that it, it actually stifles the enjoyment that you get out of watching it. Pac-12 and Big 12 football was a lot of fun to watch this year. Big Ten games often were not because they were just they were just gladiatorial battles, um, and those are fun in their own way, but not when not when it's just just brutal to watch. And too many of the games were were blowouts, and too many of the quarterbacks just couldn't make plays. Um, so you may want to look at how often you know teams are flagged, whether they're calling enough pass interference, all that stuff. I think the Big Ten has to do a holistic review of how the games are called in the league because the defense is just too ferocious. Okay. All right. I, 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 uh, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but holy cow, the PAC 12 and big 12 were so much more fun to watch on a weekly basis. I mean, yeah. the big 10 games. They're terrible. They're boring. They were terrible this year. They were absolutely terrible this year. Uh, Some of it's how I, the game's called. You, you can look at the penalty numbers and you'll see. Like part the, of that, 
Yeah, part of that was because Ohio State and Michigan were were so far above everybody else that you didn't have a lot of competitive games at the top. But uh, man, I I would have I would have so much rather watched Utah UCLA than Wisconsin Purdue. Holy cow! It's not even a not even a contest. That's right. I, th- I think that's I think it's part of it, and part of it's the weather. You know. Um, there's domes in the Big 12. There's good weather in the in many parts of the Pac-12. I know not everywhere, but many parts. And you know, once it hits November in the Big 10, it's brutal. So um, maybe there aren't domes in the Big 12. I don't know. But the weather in the Big 12 is way better. It just is. And, and it helps the overall quality of play. And if you you know, you look at the number of defensive penalties in the Big 10, it's just some of these defenses are awful and they never got flagged. Because it, it, they can just do all kinds of stuff. So that is our week. Uh, let's see. Nebraska volleyball up 20 to 18 in set four over Oregon. Looks like Allie Batenhorst is having one hell of a match, maybe one of the best matches of her career, as is Lindsey Krause. And uh, we'll see if Nebraska pulls it off. For Dirk and Tom, I'm saying that's this week. Maybe next week we'll be talking about Nebraska volleyball in the final four. I guess we'll find out. Nice Husker fans.